I'm Oliver Glass, the Editor-in-Chief of the American Journal of Psychiatry Residence Journal. Today I'm honored to be interviewing the nutritional researcher Dr. Joel Furman. Dr. Joel Furman is a board-certified family physician, best-selling author, and nutritional researcher who specializes in preventing and reversing disease through nutritional methods. He's the author of 11 books, six that have been on the New York Times bestseller list. Dr. Furman serves as the president of the Nutritional Research Foundation. His foundational discoveries on food addiction and human hunger were published in the Nutrition Journal. He is on the health science faculty at Northern Arizona University, supervising nutritional research projects. Dr. Furman has appeared on hundreds of radio and television shows, including The Today Show, Good Morning America, Live with Kelly, and The Dr. Oz Show. Dr. Furman, thank you for inviting my wife and I to your house for this interview. Well, my pleasure. I'm excited to talk to you today. So what got you interested in diet? You know, I think I started reading books on diet when my father was ill when I was a child, but also because he brought them into the house to help himself lose weight and get healthier. But also with my competitive figure skating career, we were always looking to a way to improve our stamina and, you know, and just we just were eating healthy to be, to not get sick so we can keep training. So I just became interested in it as a you know, when in my teenage years. How did you become the doctor in the movie Fat, Sick and Nearly Dead? I remember watching that movie when I was in medical school. I think um Joe Cross, who was the man who who went on that juice fast in the movie, sought me out. He must have um, heard about my book, a book I had written, and he was doing research, and he found me, and he sought me out to, and he came and approached me. Wow. So what would you say is the was the most surprising thing that you discovered when uh, being the doctor in that movie? I don't think I discovered anything in that movie. I really, it was his movie. And he was doing what he wanted to do, and I was supporting him to make sure it was safe for him. But I was not the person who recommended him fasting 60 days on vegetable juice. I would not have recommended that or, or wanted him to do that because what you, whatever you do in the short term, short-term weight loss isn't going to result in long-term benefits. Whatever weight you lose or he lost would have only benefited him fully if he kept that weight off for the rest of his life. And he didn't set himself up with the knowledge and tools and training to really go on and live healthfully to, ma- to maintain the weight loss that he achieved. He was left after the movie, after the juice diet, with this idea that he would eat healthier and that would stay off. But that was only part of the story. So I think um, I wouldn't have perhaps had that movie been the way it was if I was in control of it. Right. So I know that a lot of people will be on these juicing diets. Right. Um, and I, you know, it doesn't seem like you advocate just for being on a, a juicing diet, even for a, like a month or some kind of detox period. Or I do not. Okay. I don't mind if people want to do a water fast or a juice fast if they're slim and healthy. And then they're going to lose weight below their ideal weight and gain that weight back again after they stop the fast because they allow their weight to fluctuate from their place of normal weight to a low a weight that was little too low for them and back to the normal weight again. But the way it's been used that a lot of people use fasting when they're overweight to lose weight, now they're yo-yoing your, their weight down from a weight from a, from a body weight and a fat percent that's too heavy down to a spot where they're still too heavy. And then they've radically slowed the metabolic rate down. So when they're completed with that process, they're going to gain their weight back again or some of the weight back again. And when your weight fluctuates from being overweight to becoming less overweight, and then you gain back fat. Whenever you put fat back on your body, you put back on more visceral fat. The fat is more saturated, and it's not good for your long-term health with regard to cancer protection or heart disease protection. What I'm saying right now is yo-yoing your weight while you're overweight is not favorable. We want to teach people a methodology to lose weight that they can stick with for the rest of their life. And that's why we teach people how to eat a diet that protects against cancer and protects against long-term dementia. So they understand the benefits of eating natural foods. And they have a diet high in phytonutrients and antioxidants to reduce free radicals. And they're learning how to make these anti-cancer foods and these anti-cancer recipes taste good. And they're doing it for the long-term goal with the understanding that this is a permanent dietary change that they're trying to adapt their skill set and their taste buds to so they can stick with it forever. Because anytime you lose weight, Unless you're, you're not going to stay there unless you continue to do the same thing that got you there. Whatever you did to get there doesn't just stay there. If you go back to living your life another way, it's going to come back and your weight will eventually adjust to whatever way you're living long term. 
So I'm trying to establish with people the skills to maintain healthy living long term. That's really great. And so what got you interested in writing the book, Fast Food Genocide? Well, thank you for that question. Well, you know, I know a lot of people are aware that we have an epidemic of heart attacks, strokes, and dementia, and cancer. And I think a lot of people are aware that what we eat creates those diseases, that heart disease doesn't have to happen. And there are populations of civilizations around the world that we can study, even in today's time, like the Catawba Island study, where those people don't have heart attacks, and neither their ancestors never had heart attacks. So in other words, and we have studies that show that heart disease, even advanced heart disease, is reversible with aggressive nutritional interventions. So I think the message is starting to get out that drug, that treating these symptoms and these diseases with drugs does not allow people or afford people the opportunity to really get well, that drugs just cover up the symptoms and perhaps even increase the risk of cancer because some of these medications are mildly carcinogenic and increase risk of cancer like calcium channel blockers. But nevertheless, what I'm saying right now is this idea that food and what we eat creates mental illness is not as accepted as generally recognized as food treating obesity, diabetes, and even cancer. So today in today's society, we have almost one in five Americans that are mentally ill, whereas 100 years ago, it was one in 100 Americans. And what I'm saying is the initial data strongly suggests that what we eat doesn't just damage our body, it damages our brain. In fact, the brain is very susceptible to damage because this bag of fat can become oxidized. In other words, this bag of fat is damaged from free radicals. And the major, causes of the, the major cause of chronic disease, including atherosclerosis and dementia and cancer, the major cause is the buildup of reactive oxygen species, and free radicals, of course, and advanced glycation end products. In other words, the buildup of these metabolic wastes in our tissues age our kidney and age our heart and age our... But they also age the brain tremendously. They can also have been shown to interfere with creativity and attention deficit and, and intelligence. In other words, children fed healthier diets, more fruits and vegetables have better intelligence and outcome, and do better in school. Prisoners in, that are fed healthier diets leave their prison sentences with less chance of recidivism and criminal behavior after that. And of course, people have better, of course, performance, intelligence, memory when they eat healthy foods. But what I'm saying right now is there's a link between fast food and commercial baked goods and major depression, a solid link in the scientific literature that's being more obvious all the time, and a link between highly concentrated calories, calories that get absorbed into the bloodstream very rapidly, and lack of phytonutrients and fiber with addictive type symptoms that mimic addiction from co like from cocaine and, and opiates and barbiturates and stimulate dopamine, make people dopamine sensitive over time, and lead to behaviors that affect people how, how people's cognition and emotions. So the Fast Food Genocide book is putting a lot of these links together and also showing that populations at risk who don't have access to fresh fruits and vegetables are now blamed for their lack of health and their lack of intellectual or economic achievement as if it's their skin color or genetics. And I'm showing people that this has nothing to do with, that, that actually these belief systems, for example, that black Americans have you know, the high, such high rates of prostate cancer and breast cancer and dementia and kidney failure, as if there's something wrong with their genes that are making them with a higher propensity for these diseases. And I'm saying, no, that's not true. If you look at the data, the same white Caucasian populations that are put in bad nutritional situations still develop high rates of disease. And it's not these, the differences between individuals is not great. It's very slight. And it's not the cause of these differences in, in diseases that we're seeing or the difference in potential for economic advancement or for education, or for, it's not, it's all, it's really based on the food. And what I'm saying right now, it's the food, stupid. In other words, people are saying it's the food. It's a, it's a statement that people say, we're damaging our population with food, and it's causing an immense amount of human suffering and human tragedy. It doesn't have to happen. Can you tell our listeners about the blue zones? I know there's a lot of discussion about blue zones. Right. The blue zones are the areas around the world where we see the most long-lived people and the most centenarians. And they may not represent the ideal diet because they're just eating diets that are, that are foods that are available in their area and they happen to be living a long time. So they're one of the tools we have to look at to show that how one diet style is better than another. And we can see that the blue zones are all areas of the world where people eat lots of vegetables, where they generally eat lots of beans. They eat very low amounts of animal products and almost no processed foods and, and high glycemic sweeteners like honey and maple syrup. 
In other words, they're eating areas where they're eating relatively healthy. A lot of these areas of the world, they're either farming or gardening or growing a lot of their own food or gathering it. It's not food that's shipped in from far places. They're actually involved with the production of their own food, and they're generally populations that have good social connections with each other. So we're starting to put together the pieces of the puzzle so people, so we can live a longer, happier life. And the whole point is we want a healthy life expectancy where we can live a long time and not be sick in our later years so we can enjoy fully the years we're alive. And what I'm saying right now is that the American diet with 60% of calories from processed foods, like pasta and bread and oils and the sugar and cakes and cookies and, and crackers and chips, and 35% from animal products, this diet that's so low in colorful, phytonutrient-rich, antioxidant-rich vegetation, so low, is causing a multitude of serious problems. And the same diet that causes heart disease causes most common cancers, causes dementia, and also makes us more susceptible to emotional and mental problems as well. There was a web page that I was looking at, and it had a list of many centenarians. But what struck me was that there was a lot of variability in their diets. And I remember even reading about one of them that said, oh, don't listen to any dietary advice. Just eat what you want. Life is short anyways, something along those lines. But a lot of them obviously did follow a healthy diet. I was just wondering sort of, why there would be so much variability. Probably genetics is playing a role in a lot of it too. I wanted to get your opinion on that. Right. That's why we never look at one individual as an example. Like, cause for, I, when I was younger, I had one of my skating teachers smoked cigarettes right into his, he was 95th birthday. He chain smoked right through his 95. It was amazing. He lived that long while he's a chain smoker. You know, but that doesn't justify smoking cigarettes or make cigarettes live you to be 95 years old either. In other words, that's why we look at epi epidemiologic studies. That's why we study thousands, even tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of people. We give more credence to studies that go on for decades that look at hard endpoints, not soft endpoints. And a hard endpoint is death or cancer or heart attack. A soft endpoint might be you lost some weight or your triglycerides went down. So we want to give more credence to these studies that go on long term. And what we find when we look at these long term studies is that more natural vegetation in the diet, and particularly more beans and more nuts and more greens, leads to a longer life. And that any one individual, right, has, you know, longevity is a bell-shaped curve. In other words, on a particular eating style, you're going to have a bell-shaped curve that represents the genetic exposure to that population. So in this country, the average person, let's just say, lives to be 80 years old on the average. It's really like a little less, maybe 79 and a half, but it's, let's say 80 years old. That means the bell peaks at 80, but it might be start at age 60, but then this, the, the 20 years before 80, it's going to go to 20 years after 80 to go 100. So the bell's going to go from 60 to 100, and eating the away Americans eat, you're going to be a, a crapshoot of not knowing where you're going to fall along that wide bell between 60 and 100. It could be anywhere, practically, based on your genetics. You follow me? But now we look at populations that are living a much healthier way of life. They don't just shift the bell over. The bell narrows as it shifts. So now we have less people dying young. And so now when we shift the bell over the 90 or 95 age, in some of the blue zones, for example, we find that the bell shifts so that the people that live longer live a little longer, but the people live shorter only live a little shorter. We don't see people dying in those populations in their 60s and 70s. They all live to be like 80s, and then the, even though it peaks at around 90, you follow me? So what, so what I'm saying is interviewing one person and how long they live is not as informative or valuable as looking at populations and seeing what the whole population gets out of a diet, because we're always going to have discrepancy among individuals. Could you tell me again what the link is between fast food and, and depression, or what the data is showing in terms of mental illness and fast food? Well, yes, the data shows that commercial baked goods and fast food increase the risk of depression in a dose-dependent manner, and, the, and I think it's the the risk over a 10 or 20 year period, or I'm not sure the amount of time they studied it for, but for people having two or more servings a week of commercial baked goods or fast or commercial fast foods, the risk of depression went up 51%. Can you imagine 51%? That's like incredibly, that's just from a couple of servings a week. And it went up to 60, 70 or more percent based on more servings of, of those servings a week over that, over the period of study. So what I'm saying right now is that they may not understand the mechanism, but we understand the mechanism with which tissue damage, cellular damage, and even brain damage occurs. It's like things get rot rotten. They get rancid. We develop free radicals, and the brain needs a continual exposure to radical, free radical fighters, which is what food gives us. And this is why when we eat green vegetables and berries and beans and 
you know, mushrooms and onions, when we eat natural plant foods, they have so many antioxidants in them that when, our, when we metabolize calories and when free radicals are produced by our cells from the metabolism and utilization of calories, that's okay because those free radicals are controlled by the antioxidants contained within the food you're eating. So we don't, form a, we don't keep building up more and more free radicals. A matter of fact, the flavonoids in berries and beans um, activate the body's anti-free radical machinery. And the ITCs are actually a fuel. The ITCs come from cruciferous green vegetables. Also activate the NRF2 transcription proteins. In other words, what I'm saying right now is that built into our cellular machinery is something called the ARE, or antioxidant response element, on our genes. And those gene segments are activated by food that we eat, flavonoids, green vegetables. And without the activation of those elements on your, on your cells, the cell ages and gets damaged. We need these foods in the right amount that contain these nutrients for our cells to be adequately keep themselves healthy, clean, and functioning normally. And combine that with all the toxic waste products we eat in our diet and are exposed to. Combine that with the fatty, all these oils and excess omega-6 fats we get, which, which throws off our omega-6, omega-3 balance on our cellular membranes. And combine that with all these excess calories we're consuming. Because these foods lead to addictive behaviors with food, which activate the primitive brain to want to keep craving and, and overeating food. And the, then your cerebral self no longer is in control of the bank. What I'm saying out the drive to snort cocaine or to eat donuts, you know, or to, or to take opiates overpowers your um, logic and scientific self. So that drives your behavior and you lose becoming the person you could be. You're not as kind and forgiving. You're not as intelligent and creative. You're not as productive and you're not as good as a parent. Or as good as a... In other words, what I'm saying right now is this addictive relationship that we develop with drugs and alcohol and food inhibits our ability to live a healthy life and to live a happy life. And I'm also saying that fast food and processed foods are so depre are so have such a negative effect on our emotions that even when you don't develop major depression, it causes dysthymia. In other words, people still have a flat day affect and are and their mood is inhibited even when they don't become depressed because when they're food addicts. And most of our population are now overweight food addicts. We recently saw the Clemson Tigers honored with fast food and made a lot of headlines. Do you have any thoughts on that? You know, my thoughts are, you know, it's funny because you, you bring, you reward children and people are rewarded with fast food and junk food. And, you know, it's funny when my daughter, Kara, was four years old, we took her, she was at a health club where she went to this um, exercise class and she came out and she met me in the hallway and she said, don't these parents love their children? And I said, of course they love their children. She said, well, why are they feeding them, why are they feeding them like, cheese doodles and, um, and candy just because we did, when we did an exercise class. Isn't that stuff going to hurt their bodies? And I said, yeah, but it will hurt their bodies, but they don't know what we know that, that food makes who you are and food makes your body. And she said, how could they be so stupid? And so my kids could never grasp the fact that parents would encourage and reward and give their children these foods that they, that they knew were going to hurt them and because my kids never could figure that out. And I said, well, they don't even know. It's just because everybody's doing it. It's like socially accepted. So people have, they, don't, they have cognitive dissonance. They don't even realize they're hurting somebody because they're addicted, they're addicted to the food themselves. They think that they're, they're rationalized that they're okay doing it. They think that it's not going to hurt their kids because they did it. They must, it must not be okay for them. It must be okay for their kids. So they've completely divorced themselves from the idea that what they eat affects who they become and who they are. And it's so it's just so they're asking them. We can reward people. We we celebrate with food. We celebrate with poisonous substances. Somebody asked me a question the other night. They said to me, "What if you have these memories of your mother making you these fancy cakes with and ice creams and whipped creams, and you want to go and bring back warm memories?" And I'm saying, "Well, what if your mother had the warm memories from snort, from shooting heroin or from being an alcoholic?" Was that what you would do because those were giving you more memories because your mother did it? Your mother died of cancer, by the way. She, she died of cancer with all the junk food she ate and made, and now she's going to increase your risk of cancer. Those aren't warm memories. Those are pretty sad memories that you didn't learn how to, use, how, to, how to develop a taste for and how to use natural foods in a safe way that will give you pleasure that wouldn't simultaneously hurt you and destroy your parents' life and cause them so much suffering. It would have been so much better if we could have learned how to make, how to use food in a much better way for kindness and to, for health 
and to still make it taste good, just as good. And we're not blaming anybody if they just don't know any better, but we know better today. And we've got to use modern nutritional science to our advantage. And we've got to start to do better than our ancestors and our parents did. I know that in New York, there was an attempt to limit soda sizes, this American diet that's very popular amongst its citizens. And so I'm just trying to think what can politicians do? Some of them may uh, propose a healthy diet, but it may not be popular and it may not get them the votes because maybe people aren't relating to it as much. I agree with you, but but don't forget, let's take Mayor Bloomberg because he tried to pass that large soda law where you couldn't get large servings of soda. And people made it stink and everybody yelled about it and the legislature turned it down. They didn't pass the law. But because of all the discourse about the soda and big sodas not being good, soda consumption went down in New York dramatically, even when the law didn't pass. And you know what happened to the light? And so all his efforts, Mayor Bloomberg, for bringing the street carts, selling fruits and vegetables to the poor areas, allowing them to use food stamps, and, allowing, and, get, and getting them with the electronics to use credit cards and the, and the vendors bringing food to the poor areas, the, the subsidies they gave for supermarket development, the lack of smoking in public places, places, the discussion about posting calories on menus, including fast food men, menus, and not serving amounts of soda. You know what happened as a result of all that, even though everything didn't work? the lifespan of New Yorkers increased dramatically. In other words, we saw dramatic benefits to the health of New Yorkers. Less heart attacks, less emergency room visits, less people hospitalized in nursing homes, and less strokes, and an overall increase of lifespan. So just the discussion brought, to the, brought into the public arena had a positive effect. You know, so, he, so Mayor Bloomberg did get stuff done. He did save lives with that. As a forensic psychiatry fellow, I know, we, well, I know that you were just mentioning a little bit about the prison population and and uh, the mental health population, but I actually began to ask a lot of the inmates that I treat about what their diet was like prior to being incarcerated. And honestly, almost all of them have been telling me that they eat fast food. And I was wondering, what's your thought on the link between fast food and, and maybe someone committing crimes? And don't forget, I mean, I'm certainly giving you what I've learned through my education, research, and reading. But I'm trying not to really insert opinion as much as I, as I can. And just to tell you, um, this is not a belief system, so to speak. I'm saying that there's a lot of scientific support for what we're discussing right now. And there's a tremendous amount of scientific support for the consumption of candy and sweets and later life drug use and criminal drug use. In other words, what I'm saying right now is that the scientific literature shows a strong association between heavier consumption of sweets and candy in childhood and later life drug addiction and criminal or incarceration. So there is a relationship there. And the relationship between unhealthy food and drug abuse and crime is better than the link between social isolation, poverty, or abuse of parents, or lack of parents, and later life criminals. So even though you, you can't prove this for sure, we know it's a strong association, and we know the effects on the human brain. And what I'm saying right now is that we have an increasing, that increasing violence, and when we have somebody who's violent and, you know, irrational behavior, killing other humans, behaving in a manner not in their own best interest. Nobody's talking about the effect of our food, of our, the food being a contributor. Nobody's discussing it. Be and, and food is a contributor. And whether you, how much you accept what percentage of that is and how strong the effect is, because it doesn't, because obviously some people are more susceptible to it than others. But we're talking here about the fact that we're weakening our genome that we're passing on damaged gene to future generations. We're caught by the way we eat and all these processed foods and commercial meats and processed meats and chemicals. We're showing the relationship between childhood cancer and the diet the parents eat, not just during pregnancy, but prior to conception. And I'm saying parents, even the diet the father eats, even if eating fast food can affect the health of their children, whether it's autism, whether it's childhood cancers and brain tumors, whether it's the intelligence of your child, whether the higher intakes, the higher increase of allergies and autoimmune illnesses, it's all related to the, to the degradation of our food supply and the growth of the fast food industry that, and people no longer eating healthy produce grown from good soils. So we have to sense what I'm saying is that if we really want to put a dent into a lot of these problems, we got to look at all the potential causes here and try to make improvements. What shocked me, though, is that when I see the inmates around lunchtime, they're being given bologna sandwiches. Literally, it's two white pieces of bread and a cut of the bologna oh, in God. the middle. And that's all they're getting for lunch. Wow. And so I don't know if that's 
somehow hindering them. I mean, obviously, by what you're saying, Absolutely. it's obvious. But it I just want I'm, the reason I'm actually bringing this up is I just want to get your opinion and, and just so that we can all start thinking about the societal implications. Absolutely. And of course, you know, we're the only country in the world that allows our children to be fed class two carcinogens at the, in, the, in the cafeteria. In other words, European countries and even the Middle Eastern countries, the World Health, they accept the World Health Organization's conclusion that processed meats are a class 2A carcinogen and they and they don't allow them to be served to children. And we, of course, in this country serve them to kids and you know, the effects are we know what's going on. But of course that We've also done studies where prison populations have started um, growing organic gardens, gardening, gardens, and eating some of the vegetables they produce, and watch the beneficial effect it had on them, those on them, and their education, and their you know ability to um, progress with their lives in a more favorable way. So certainly, part of the problem is if you feed a sensitive population foods that do not contain micronutrients including antioxidants and phytochemicals, you're going to perpetuate and even worsen, worsen some of the brain conditions that got, there, that got them there in the first place. Food controls who we are health-wise, but also controls our behavior as well. So why do you think, and you've said this already, but why do you think psychiatrists should focus more on diet with their patients? And do you have any advice for us on when we should incorporate that in our discussion with our patients? You know, I've been trying to include that in my initial evaluation, just asking about diet and, and uh, counseling on, on, Absolutely. on fast food, if, if they're eating fast food and the dangers associated with that. Um, what, do you, what recommendations do you have for us? Yeah, just like if you saw a person with diabetes. You know, diabetes increases your risk of depression. The sugar, the higher blood sugar, increases risk of depression. If you saw a patient with diabetes, you'd be telling them to lower their blood sugar, and hopefully you'd be counseling them about what they eat and to lose weight. Well, the first thing you do when a person comes in with a mental or emotional problem has to be to have them to try to live a healthier life because the medications, as people know and as you guys know, are not always 100% effective. They're far from 100% effective. And unless you fix the fatty acid imbalance, the nutrient imbalance, unless you start to get this person healthier, you're not going to have much ability to help, to help them. You're very limited. What, In other words, we as physicians are very limited in our effect on a person's ultimate long-term health. Sure, we can help them in the short run. Sure, emergencies, you know, in an emergency, we can do what we can save a life and we can do things. But if we're looking for long-term benefit, we're going to have to get the person to change their lifestyle to, for long-term benefits, whether that's physical long-term or emotional long-term. And I'm, and I'm critical of psychiatrists frequently because I notice that they generally look for whatever can give the short-term results without thinking of the long-term effect of this medication could have on this person. You know, they're looking for instantaneous, immediate benefit with no real thought put into what's going to benefit this person in the long run. And without a nutritional component of the advice given, you're not giving the person an opportunity to have good long-term results. And just going back to the topic of fast food, what are some of the most scariest ingredients in the fast food diet? How can we be better informed? Well, some of the most scariest ingredients are the fried foods, because when you take French fries or fried chicken and you cook a food in oil, that oil in a fast food restaurant has been heated up all day long. And heated oil forms carcinogenic compounds. We're even seeing studies on people that work in first fast food restaurants having increased lung and breathing and other increased risks of certain cancers when they don't even eat the food just from breathing in the fumes from the fast food fryers. We're saying now that these foods are exceedingly dangerous. It's not just the unhealthy food. They're also cooking it and preparing it in a way that increases the carcinogenic, the, um, you know, the carcinogenic effects. So right now, when you're eating a food that's a, a meats, for example, that are flame broiled, or fried on a grill, or barbecued, you're increasing heterocyclic amines, n nitrosamino compounds, and, and a lot of other carcinogenic agents. So it's the way you're not putting some animal product into a soup and water-based cooking it. To put, you know, you're cooking it, you're burning it essentially, you're grilling the outside of it, forming carcinogens, and then you're frying the vegetables of the potato in an oil, and then you're taking some, and you're adding sweets onto that. And this this concept, or the the combination between the the cooked animal product which floods the body with, with exposure to carcinogens and higher levels of IGF-1, mixed with the high glycemic carbohydrates, with the oils that are, that are rancid and now carcinogenic. This, this diet style couldn't be designed better by Al-Qaeda or ISIS to kill us. It's, a, it's, a, it's foods purposely, or you could say couldn't be better scientifically designed to cause damage to humans. It's just insanity.
I was just talking to someone um, about diet for our children. Um, I, don't, I don't have a child yet or any children with my wife yet, but, you know, just preparing for the future. And um, this person that I was talking to was saying that it would be bad parenting to not let your child enjoy candies and sugary foods such as donuts from time to time. Not that you should do it every day, but, you know, as a reward. Um, do you think there's a benefit with delaying a child's exposure to candies and making sure that you're not giving any candy, any sugary foods until like they're three years old or five years old? Um, is there any long-term benefit to that that you think? Of course. Absolutely. There's no reason to give a kids to give a kid whiskey or, or marijuana or have them use poisonous or harmful substances. Candy is just because adults are addicted to it and our socialization process is that the people think it's normal. It's damaging them, nevertheless. And my kids always loved our desserts the best. They didn't even like that stuff because they got used to our desserts. So we'll make an ice cream with, let's say, frozen banana whipped with macadamia nuts and some real vanilla bean powder. If I want to put a little cocoa powder in there, I could put cocoa powder in a date to sweet and make it taste like chocolate. We can make chocolate puddings, chocolate chia puddings, brat bean brownies, ice creams made with frozen fruit, cookies made with whole grains and beans. And, and in other words, there's no... Our children or children whose parents are feeding them foods that are safe are not depriving their children of fun or socialization or the enjoyment of eating. The opposite is true. People get more enjoyment knowing it's good for you, but they get more enjoyment knowing they're not, they're not being restricted as much as how much they can eat of it. There's more freedom. I've never, my kids have never felt deprived. Matter of fact, the neighborhood children used to come over our house for our fudgesicle pops and desserts we used to make. And, the, and they used to say, well, can't you teach my parents how to make this stuff? So the idea that it's convenient or easy to hand the kid a prepared donut or a candy made by some manufacturer who doesn't have your kid's best interest at heart, that's just insanity. You're not doing anything better for the kid. I remember when my child, when my, my son, Sean, I think he first went to the to watch his older sisters in a in a choir, and they were might have been in third or fourth. I don't remember what grade they were in, but he must have been four years old where his face came to the edge of the table. And as he walked into the school to watch his sisters, somebody handed him a chocolate chip cookie. Now, he never saw a chocolate chip cookie like that before. He smelled it, and he took a little bite out of it, a little nib out of it, and he, said, and he spit it out. And go, that's, that's like, he said, that's junk food. Ooh! You know, his taste buds didn't enjoy eating something that was so heavily sugared or heavily, you know, he wants his stuff that he got used to. These, they were never, there's no deprivation in feeding a child healthy things. So what do we know about a plant-rich diet and its impact on our overall health? You've talked about it a bit already, um, but just in general, plant-rich diet, is that the way to go 100% of the time? Well, yes, I'm saying that the diet has to be nutrient-dense and plant-rich which means that the highest de nutrient density are in green vegetables. And our diet has to contain green vegetables to be healthy, like other primates, with as necessary nutrients in those green vegetables as humans that we require, like folate. And if you don't get folate from green vegetables and think you can access it from folic acid, so you don't have to eat the green vegetables. Don't forget folic acid is made by a, is, is made by a petroleum company. It's synthetic, made from petroleum. And it's linked to prostate cancer and higher risk of breast cancer. You pay a price for that. Because when you're getting your folate from green vegetables, it comes along in the same package with a thousand other nutrients. Not just, you know, with, there's not just the 36 micronutrients the government keeps track of, but hundreds of nutrients, maybe even thousands of nutrients, probably about 700, of course, in natural green vegetables. And these aren't optional. We need these for normal function of our, our immune system. So what I'm saying right now is that when we eat a diet that's nutrient-dense, I mean, I have this acronym I call G-BOMBS, G-B-O-M-B-S, greens, beans, onions, mushrooms, berries, and seeds, identifying the foods that have the strongest correlation and the strongest effects in scientific studies to reduce people's risks of cancer. And we put together a dietary portfolio that includes all these nutrient-rich foods and phytochemical-rich foods we see miraculous results in people. Their blood pressure drops. Their atherosclerosis melts away and the open and the, the obstructive coronary artery disease goes away and the blood flows through the, through the arteries that were now obstructed. Over time, the amount of plaque that was there lessens as they lose weight and eat healthier. Their emotions improve. Almost every person who's dropped, you know, 50 to 100 pounds using my protocols report that the mental fog lifted, they can think more clearly and they feel better emotionally. 
It's almost universally the same response, how much better they feel emotionally, and they can think more clearly, and their mental fog is gone. In other words, we're watching people feel better about their life, and when they eat enough of these healthy foods, it also ratchets down their apostat. And the micronutrient deficiencies were contributing to their overeating behavior and their inability to, to control their, their appetite. You become a food and calorie-consuming monster when you're, bot, when you're so micronutrient deficient. So everything is intermingled. And when you, do one, when you start to eat a healthy diet, yes, we're saying with, a lot, with rich in a lot of these high-nutrient plants, reducing the amount of animal products to make more room for these plant foods, and of course eliminating or greatly reducing the processed foods that are so dangerous as well, so we can have a plant-rich diet. And then we see we protect against all the diseases of aging, including heart disease, dementia, strokes, and cancers. What about coffee? Is that okay? I know that uh, green tea is very popular. Um, can you walk us through coffee versus green tea? Well, there, these, for both the green tea elements, the, some of those elements in green tea have been shown in studies to have beneficial effects to fight cancer. The caffeine is not the greatest element if people overdo the caffeine because it can keep them awake at night or it can actually make them not require sleep or be able to get by with less sleep and it's better to get the sleep they need. So caffeine in an overdose and too much coffee or tea can have negative effects. And putting too much very, very hot liquid on your tongue or throat can increase risk of certain contact cancers like, like tongue cancer or throat cancer. I'm eating things that are very, very hot and heated up. But generally speaking, there are some benefits to the flavonoids in, in coffee beans and cocoa beans and, of course, some benefits to the EGCGs and all those chemical, those beneficial phytochemicals in green tea as well. So there are some benefits to use moderately. And if you're not taking in a lot of sugar and you're not overdoing it with being too hot or too often to get too much caffeine. But on the other hand, neither am I saying that those foods are, ne those are necessary for good health. Those, you do not need to ha drink coffee or have green tea to have excellent health because you can get those nutrients and beneficial nutrients from other foods and other sources. Should we add a little bit of alcohol to our diet? There's a lot of studies that discuss moderate alcohol drinking. Some say it's good. Some say it's bad. I think there's been an argument that moderate alcohol drinking has some beneficial effects, but I think at this point that's been disproven right now. We know that even lower amounts of alcohol exposure increases risk of cancer and alcohol is a carcinogen. Ideally, it's best not to drink alcohol. Um, there is some evidence to suggest that some of the um, negative effects of alcohol can be offset from the resveratrol in grapes or in, from wine or something like that, but those studies are usually not as long-term with as much people, with as much, you know, large scale looking at hard endpoints, as much as the studies that have come out in the last few years showing that even moderate amounts of alcohol increase risk of common cancers like breast cancer and, and epithelial cell cancers. So it's probably best not to drink alcohol. And if you are drinking it, as little as possible. Let me give you an example. Um, one glass of wine per day increased risk of breast cancer in women by 12% in the largest study looking at that issue. 12% is a significant number. So if you're going to drink alcohol, a woman is going to get more risk from a man because her body is smaller, her liver is smaller. So probably the most a woman should drink is one or two glasses a week, not one or two glasses a day. What can you tell us about the link between autism and diet? Uh, I know that I was reading in your book that the folate supplementation and autism. Yeah, I, I, we don't have the answers, but we know that that folic acid is not the same molecule and doesn't work chemically in the body like real folate from vegetables does. But when we give people this folic acid pill, it's like a permission slip because they no longer have to be that careful having to eat all the high folate foods like green vegetables and beans. So we know that there's a relationship between the use of folic acid and higher risks of autism, but I, I, we don't know if, if folic acid is causing autism or it's just that these women who were not taking, who were taking folic acid, weren't eating as much vegetables, which have folate in them, of course. One thing we do know is that higher vegetable consumption and higher folate consumption from natural foods, which means you're taking in, I'm not saying folate is the vehicle which is protecting against autism. It's just folate is the marker of a diet high in phytochemicals and antioxidants. So when you eat a diet high in vegetation, high in colorful plant foods and beans, you're going to have a very high blood level for folate. And a high blood level for folate is linked to a lower rate of autism. So in other words, we want to increase our blood exposure to folate, and our blood, but we want to do it through the, doing it the correct means by high vegetable exposure, because that's the methodology to, increase, to decrease autism the most. 
What about a little bit of fish in our diet? Well, I'm, I'm suggesting that a person have a diet that's plant-rich, and if they choose animal products, it's restricted to a lower amount in the diet. Now, what lower amount is safe? In other words, am I saying 10% or 5%? And, you know, it depends on genetic risk in, in individuals, but basically what I'm saying is that cardiovascular reversal studies show the reduction of animal products to 5% or less of calories seems to be necessary to get maximum reversal of atherosclerosis. So we're talking about, there may be many people who can do fine, and most of the blue zones are all populations that eat less than 10% of calories from animal products. So at a minimum, reduce it to 10%. Some of us might do better between 0 and 5%. But once you cut back to 0 and you're on a vegan diet, which may be the most longevity-promoting diet, might be, but then it's, it behooves us to be careful because then we have to make sure we're supplementing with zinc and B12 and DHA and iodine. In other words, we may have to make sure, particularly if we're not salting our foods using iodinated salt, not taking in seaweed or seafood to get the iodine, we absorb zinc from plant foods only 20% is of efficacy compared to absorbing zinc from animal products at 80% efficacy. And we don't get enough exposure to DHA or EPA, what are commonly called fish oil, from plant exposure. In other words, the conversion of ALA, alpha linolenic acid, into the long chain EPA and DHA is not efficient. It varies genetically, and a large percent of people become have unfavorable levels of DHA and omega-3 index when their diet is completely vegan without supplementation. But that's okay because people can take vegan supplements of EPA and DHA nowadays if you want to be a vegan. So what I'm saying is as long as we supplement it conservatively and intelligently, it's okay to be a vegan and exclude fish, or you can eat a small amount of fish. But either way, it's not good to eat a large amount of animal products, even a large amount of fish, which can expose you to, to, to other toxins in the fish, but particularly to higher rates of animal protein, which then raises certain hormones that accelerate aging. What if we get bored with eating beans and we begin to crave meat and we just find ourselves wanting to eat the meat, otherwise we're going to be miserable, or at least we tell ourselves that in the initial phase of the, yeah. the diet transition? Well, that's right. When, when you're taking away something that people are habituated to, and, and even addicted to. There's a different phases. The first week, they're kind of fatigued and uncomfortable. There's even something called withdrawal depression that occurs when you take away people's sugar. You know, but in, in any case, um, these foods have a very have high caloric concentration, and especially the fatty meats, because the brain is now addicted to the caloric rush. And then once you get rid of the physical addiction part, where you're feeling better in a couple of weeks, there's still that emotional addiction that people it takes many months to get rid of. Like when people quit smoking, they're through with the physical withdrawal, but then six months later, they're still, they still want to go out and have that cigarette. It takes a lot of time to get rid of that emotional attraction to the habit they've developed that people have habituated. So when people ha are highly susceptible to addiction, it's those people that we really have to put them in a safe environment and make sure they're not cheating or eating foods they shouldn't be eating. Because even a trigger, even one cup cupcake, donut, cookie, or, or can trigger them to go back off their diet and go back to overeating again and, and start gaining weight back again. So we're very careful with some of these people. But other people who can control their behavior where, where a little bit of unhealthy food or even some animal products like meat or something or cheese is not going to make them go off, go off the handle and start to overeat on it and want to eat them more. So, it, so what I'm saying right now is maybe in some people it's safe to do that. Some people it's not. My experience has been that when I have people in that fragile state, when they're known food addicts, when they're obese and they're dangerously obese with some serious disease, we do better and have less recidivism and more long-term benefits when we put them on a strictly vegan diet with no processed foods and we make them or we encourage them to stick to that for a prolonged period of time because then they lose that, we should say, illicit attraction, that illicit relationship they were using to use food for loneliness, for solace, and as a substitute for building relationships with other people. And so food be no longer is becoming their primary means of soothing their emotions, and they've developed better skills, and it, it leads to better long-term outcome. While they're still being getting removing their addictions, learning how to make healthy food taste great, retraining their taste buds, and resolving and reducing their dependency on those foods that got them in trouble. When I was looking through all these different diets online, I saw that there was this carnivore diet, and some people were claiming that this carnivore diet helped them be cured of certain illnesses. And then I saw an argument that said, how can meat be carcinogenic or detrimental to our health if certain animals live solely on it? Okay. Um, well, of course, 
the longest lived animals are the ones that eat a lot of plant foods because the antioxidants slow aging. So the primates, you know, we're talking about the poor primates, we're not carnivores like a cat. The cats and the carnivores who eat solely meat um, live very short lives, about one fifth as long as the, as let's say the monkeys or the chimps, the long vegetable eating animals, number one. So also, they're, you know, we know they have different teeth, you know, structure of their claws, but they have a shorter digestive tract, a bigger liver. They can handle a lot large amounts of uric acid and, and ammonia. In other words, you, you produce a lot of ammonia that's converted into urea and uric acid for elimination. They can do that more effectively. There's short, shorter guts for the, for the acidity produced. So they live shorter lifespans, but they're also eating some vegetation, by the way, because they're eating the bowel contents of the animals they kill. So they're not eating, they're not eating pure meat. When we eat the meat... We don't eat the bowel contents of the meat. We're not eating the vegetables. So they're getting vegetables too. It's funny because I was, I was jogging and riding a bike in, um, in, San, in the San Diego area this last month. And I'm looking at all the, what's it called? The coyote poop. Um, what do they call it? The coyote, there's a name for it. Anyway, it's, I'll just say coyote poop. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, and I'm looking, look at all the vegetable matter and all the berries and nuts in the poop. I thought these were carnivores killing rabbits and eating baby dogs. And, you know, so I was amazed that, these, that even these carnivorous or these largely carnivorous animals eat a tremendous amount of vegetation. You know? But nevertheless, those things don't matter that much because we're studying humans and we're studying human lifespans here. And we have long-term epidemiologic studies. And the long-term studies show that as animal products go up in, an, in a human's diet, in other words, what I'm saying here is all the studies that went on for decades with hundreds of thousands of people show as animal products go up in the diet and plant foods decrease, both cardiovascular death increases and cancer death increases as well. So we have the data. It's not controversial. And it's well accepted by the World Health Organization and other bodies of scientific thought. And we know now with pretty with with a large degree of certainty that we need to reduce the animal products dramatically in our diet and of course reduce processed foods the confusion came when people were substituting processed carbohydrates for animal products and saying well look people are going onto a lower fat diet with more plant foods and they're doing just as bad yeah but those plant foods were processed foods they were white flour products they were, they were we saw when they start to eat green beans or greens or nuts the opposite occurred every study that showed when animal products are reduced or grains or processed foods are reduced, and in the place you substitute more veg vegetation, nuts or beans, we see dramatic changes in lifespan and risks of all across the board of, of co common causes of death. And then, you know, when, when I was looking on YouTube about various different diets, I came across some bodybuilder videos that were advocating for, for diets that would be considered quite unhealthy based on what you've been telling us. Um, but they also advocate for whey protein and creatine supplements. Do you have any information or any opinions on that? Well, certainly our goal is not to maximize our size, you know, because maximizing size or growth means you're maximizing the chance of cells to replicate, which then promotes cancer. Of course, the shortest occupation or the shortest lived occupation in North America today was the NASH study, which studied linebackers on football teams, which showed how, how early they died because they ate to get, they get so big. But the point I'm making now, bigness is muscle size is not a criteria for health. We want to be fit. We want to be lean. We want to be strong for our body weight. But we don't want to be artificially puffed up. And we don't want steroids can do that too. And when the goal is just to get big, people take in excessive amounts of calories and excessive amounts of protein. And in doing so, in doing so you raise growth-promoting hormones that, promote, that, that permit cancer then to proliferate as well. And you're in, in doing so, you're shortening your lifespan. So what if someone wants to gain some muscle mass just because maybe they feel like they're on the thin side? Um, you know, we often get patients, you know, male patients, and they may have certain insecurities about their body type. And they want to do weight training because they feel like weight training has health benefits. Um, there's definitely a lot of data that says weight training is, is helpful. But that they feel like plant-based diets just not going to help them build a little bit more muscle mass. What would you recommend for well, them? Well, it's good that they're asking that question because now we, because it's an opportunity to explain to them that these plant foods are higher in protein than many animal products are. In other words, a hamburger might have 30% protein. But a black bean or a soybean may have 40 or 50%. Broccoli, you know, so we're talking about kids. It's an educational opportunity to explain to people that sunflower seeds and hemp seeds and pine nuts and, and whole grains and wheat germ and, and um, you know, and green vegetables and, you know, and, and all these foods, including beans and, you know, and green vegetables and most of, most of the plant foods except for fruit are relatively protein adequate and protein rich. 
So a nutritarian diet that I recommend, rich in nutrients, and of course rich in green vegetables, beans, and nuts and seeds, shows that the combination of including a lot of green vegetables, beans, and nuts and seeds increase the protein penetration and digestibility of your diet, and athletes do get enough, and even athletes can get enough protein eating this way. For those particular professional type athletes or you know, marathon runners, a person doing an incredible amount of training, they're still going to get at least 30 to 35 grams of protein per thousand calories. And as they increase their caloric burn and require more calories from their exercise, they're going to naturally take in more protein. If they require 3,000 calories, they'll be getting, you know, over 100 grams of protein a day. Um, if a person needed more because the genetically they, they felt that they could, they could then take some, not whey protein, which could, they can take a plant protein like hemp seeds or, or hemp peanut um, or hemp pumpkin you know, um, a rice pro. There's a lot of different pea proteins. There's, there's a lot, um, a lot of um, plant foods that are very high in protein, like like not just soybeans and edamame, but also things like hemp seeds or Mediterranean pine nuts. I have a lot of professional athletes I advise who are using Mediterranean pine nuts because they're so high in protein, because they want to keep their animal protein low. And we're talking about a lot of vegan professional athletes, famous basketball players like Kyrie Irving, or tennis players like Venus Williams, or you know. Te, you know, or Anna Krul, of course, maybe the major tennis players now, like Federer and, and Djokovic and Nadal. You know, they all are, look at watch their diet. Tom Brady, they're all watching their diet, not to be stronger, but to prolong their career, to age slower, and to maintain their athletic abilities more as they age. And that's why I did it too. Is always to keep yourself healthier, not getting sick, able to keep performing, develop consistency in your training habits, not mistraining with being ill, and to keep. Your, your athletic ability into your later years. So it's a no-brainer that a diet that's healthier is going to just be better for your career as an athlete as well. Dr. Furman, can you give us some examples of recipes for the tired psychiatry resident or fellow or medical student who's listening to this podcast? Well, I always want people to make a big pot of vegetable bean soup on the weekend and make it for the whole week. You know, throw in your vegetable juice and your vegetable broth with mushrooms and onions and kale and beans in there and, and spices and flavorings and blend in some care. You know, use, you could use one of my recipes or, you know, but you know, anyway, this big pot of vegetable bean soup. I put the whole pot into a top shelf of my refrigerator on Sunday nights. And then I, when it gets cold on Monday morning, I put it out into like 10 different containers. So I can always grab this container of soup with me when I'm on the travel with a, a nut and a piece of fruit. So I'm traveling. I have food with me all the time. And also, I want people to eat salad and eat raw vegetables. That means I want them to have a healthy salad dressing. So likewise, once a week, whip up, either buy a healthy salad dressing or make one yourself. And one of my dressings I make up in a flash is just to take a low-salt tomato sauce. And I'll mash some almond butter in there. If I don't want to throw it into a blender with almonds and sunflower seeds, I can just mash some almond butter, like an un, a raw almond butter, in with the tomato sauce and pour a little balsamic vinegar or fig vinegar on top. And voila, three ingredients. I have a great healthy salad dressing with tomato sauce, almond butter, and some vinegar in there. It's fantastically delicious. And, it, and that's the key. Then you can eat. You don't have to be inhibited as to how much dressing you're using on your salad because the dressing is super healthy as well. So can you walk us through one of your favorite recipes that you cook at home? Is there another recipe that we could easily make? Yeah, I have lots of favorite recipes. I just like a pea lentil soup with, with baby corn in it. But sometimes I'll just take vegetables like corn, water chestnuts, bam, you know, bamboo shoots, and, um, and, and what are they called? Snow pea pods and shredded cabbage and mushrooms. And I'll just put it in a pot with a quarter cup of water and just walk it. And I'll throw like a Thai sauce, a Thai peanut sauce on top. And I like to mix the peanuts with the hemp seeds with a date and some lemongrass, and a little cumin or turmeric in there, you know, and, and maybe I'll put a touch of vinegar in there, but I'll, I mean, I'll put a date in to sweeten it or a prune, but I'll have that, the combination between the turmeric and the cumin and, and the lemongrass, that's the secret ingredient, of course, is the lemongrass, because you can blend, blend the whole lemongrass in there, or you can cook the lemongrass in the water and then like soak it in the water, but I'm making it throwing it fast, you can buy, you can even make it quick, you can even buy a, a lemongrass paste and squeeze some lemongrass paste into it if you want, with the date and the hemp seeds and the peanuts and make a good sauce. You toss that sauce on top of the wok vegetables, walk it for another three minutes or so, and you've got a complete dinner that's really tasty. You could serve it over quinoa or just eat it straight, you know, a little bit of frozen f cherries for dessert, and you got a fantastic meal. By the way, frozen fruit is a great dessert. Just frozen cherries is a, or frozen blueberries are an incredible dessert. I remember uh, hearing one of your lectures, you saying how frozen berries are actually cheaper. And so my wife and I, we went to Costco and we bought some frozen berries, and it's just lasting much longer. And I'll add it into my breakfast. 
like an oatmeal um, with nuts. And I was just wondering, do you, do you advocate for that? Or do you think that's a good idea to have oatmeal with berries and nuts? Yes, definitely. Okay, before going to work, something yes, along those lines? that's exactly what I want you to do. Because when you eat, I don't want you to, people to snack on nuts. I want you to eat the nuts with the meals. That's why we have the nuts in the salad dressing. Because the presence of the nuts facilitates the absorption of the phytochemicals and antioxidants in the green vegetables, for example. Matter of fact, you can absorb 100 times the carotenoids and phytochemicals when there's some fat like nuts present in the meal compared to eating a salad dry with a low-fat dressing. You follow me? So yes, the, sa- the, the flax seeds, the nuts with your breakfast, with the oats, with the berries in there. And we use frozen because when you buy fresh, it, it goes bad in a day or two. It go- and people wind up throwing it out. It's super expensive. And the frozen is, you know, you can get a better quality and you can use just the amount you need and the rest goes back in the freezer and doesn't go bad. Plus, it's a third the price to begin with, so it doesn't, it doesn't make it so it's astronomically unaffordable for people who use to put berries into their diet because berries do have powerful benefits to brain functioning with increasing, decreasing risk of dementia and they've been shown in scientific studies to have anti-cancer effects too. But it, what if it doesn't say, or what if it doesn't have organic listed on there and it's one of those frozen berries? Is that still okay? Yes, it's still okay. Because there's no, there, in other words, on fresh berries, especially strawberries, they're going to put a fungicide on there to increase the shelf life. But, but since it's frozen, they're not going to treat it with fungicides to increase shelf life because the freezing keeps it fresh. So you have much less. And, and if you call, I called up a lot of the berry companies, like the Wyman Wild Berry Company, and they said they do not spray pesticides or fungicides on the berry. They do use some um, pesticides on the plant while it's still young but not when, once the berries have been starting to be formed in the plant. So the, there's very low pesticide residue, and the, the Environmental Working Group publishes a 12 dirty dozen. And even though strawberries are on there, they, they're not referring to frozen strawberries, they're referring to fresh. So if you, what I'm saying right now, if you're buying fresh berries, yes, get them organically, but if you're buying them, but if you're buying them frozen, it's probably not necessary to get organic when you buy frozen. You could, but it's probably not necessary. Dr. Furman, it was a pleasure. There we have it. Nutrition expert Dr. Joel Furman, the author of the recent book, Fast Food Genocide. 